Year 10 and 11, welcome to your analysis, comparing Ozymandias by Percy Fish Shelley and London by William Blake in preparation for your English Literature AQA Poetry exam. As this is a comparison essay, we do need to use connectives. The connectives in black are if the poems are different. You've got whereas, on the other hand, however, in contrast, unlike and alternatively. And in red there at the bottom, if the poems use similar techniques, you've got similarly, likewise, equally, as with, or in the same way. If we want to avoid shows, um, yes, use shows maybe once or twice, but not too much, you have got these suggestions. I do put them on most of my videos, so you can use suggests, implies, outlines, highlights, describes, communicates, connotes, emphasises, reveals, displays, establishes, or portrays, represents, illustrates, informs, means, conveys and symbolises. The essay format that I use with my students is as follows, but if you have been given a different one by your English teacher, then please use that. Uh, I get my students to answer the question straight away in their introduction, keeping it quite short, because time is of the essence in this exam. They would then detail the structural devices in Ozymandias, compare that to the structural devices in London. They would then move to the language devices in Ozymandias, compare that to the language devices in London, and finish with a conclusion. Uh, the conclusion, though, is the thing that you should jeopardise if you are running out of time. This paper is extremely detailed and you may not get time to add the conclusion, so please feel free to miss that off, if anything. Just a bullet point list then of the structural devices in both poems. I have done quite a few comparisons on Ozymandias, so that is briefer than London. I've never compared London to poems yet, so I've added a little bit more detail here. And please stay with me because I've got my example response on structure and language. So in Ozymandias, you have got a sonnet. The sonnet uses the iambic pentameter and for those people aiming for the grade 7, 8 and 9, your sonnet is broken up into an octave, which is the first eight lines, and the sestet, which is the second set of six lines. It's a single stanza, but it includes a lot of punctuation, which is where we get the chaserva. If you don't know the poetic terms I'm using, please check my video on poetic terminology. If you want more detail on Ozymandias, then please refer to my video on Ozymandias. In London, the structure is slightly different. We have got regular stanzas, and the regular stanzas use alternate rhyme. Um, and this is to symbolise how London is confined, conflicted, and repressed by authority. Um, the alternate rhyme also suggests that the evils of London are cyclical and will constant, uh, uh, persist. Enjambment is also used, and that builds up the speaker's anger and frustration throughout the poem. And then again, your extra challenge for your grades 7, 8 and 9 is the iambic tetrameter. Now, if you look, that is a direct um, difference with Ozymandias. Ozymandias has the iambic pentameter. Now, the iambic tetrameter, again, it's on my video on London, um, should be read near where the chart Thames does flow. And that creates this sombre tone and it emphasises that the capital city is ruined and institutions are ruined. And that noise, where chartered tends, prolongs the suffering of the people. This is my example paragraph um, comparing the two. So you might write the following. Shelley uses the sonnet to greatly emphasise the power Ozymandias had when he was alive. The six line sestet is set apart from the octave in a traditional way. But in this specific instance, it serves to further stress the image we have of this tyrannical leader. Additionally, Shelley utilises the iambic pentameter as part of the rhythm of the poem. However, instead of using this rhythm in relation to the title character, he uses it to acknowledge the passing of time and the power of time and how it will outlast Ozymandias himself. Furthermore, the alternate rhyme works in sync with the sonnet and illustrates the conflict between mankind and time. Unfortunately, the last line of the poem concludes this struggle and inevitably time wins. 
In contrast, London uses regular stands as an alternate rhyme. And this is used to symbolise how London is confined, conflicted and repressed by authority. The alternate rhyme also suggests that the evils of London are cyclical and will persist. Moreover, the utilisation of enjambment builds up the speaker's anger and frustration, and this is further amplified by the iambic tentrapenter. For example, near where the chartered Thames does flow, which also creates a sombre tone emphasising that the capital city is ruined and institutions are ruined. It also prolongs the suffering of the people. So that is what I might say about structure in the poems. I apologise for the, the filming of this video. Um, my app that I usually use isn't working. Um, if we move then to language, I've done the same thing. I've got a bullet point of the main things in Ozymandias and the main things in London. And then I've got quite a detailed response. So please stay with me. So the main things you want to be looking at in Ozymandias for language are associated with power. So we've got King of Kings, Sneer of Cold Command, Look on My Works, the adjective Colossal, which is a mirror image of the adjective Vast, and, and we get this idea through Colossal and Vast that the land is massive. It also implies that Ozymandias uh, was a powerful man, but it also ironically suggests that this is a huge disaster, that his empire has been ruined. We know he is talking to somebody mighty and he shows off what he rules when he says, look on my works and despair. And is this undertone of power and arrogance that he's boasting. But remember, ultimately, in this poem, nature ruins the statue. And this shows that nature and time have more power than him. Than him. Um, we get that in the adjective lifeless and this, this word survive. At the end of the poem, though, we get boundless and bare, and we have the, the alliteration of the B, but your grades seven, eight, and nine should mention the plosive B, boundless and bare, and that prolonging effect that the land does stretch far away, and this awful idea that nothing is left. Again, if you need more detail there, check out my video on Ozymandias. Now, if we look at London, we've got the pronoun I. Uh, Hugely important in London is repetition of chartered because even the River Thames is controlled. People's lives are controlled by the government in London, so much so that it even becomes geographical. We also get war and weakness, mark in every face. I make marks of weakness, marks of war, and the negative alliteration of the W um, heightens this idea that people are worried about the lives that they lead. The metaphor mark in every face I am going to analyse in my example response, so I'll leave that there. Uh, more simply, we've got emotive language in cry and infant. Um, it, it's always more emotive when it's a child. One of the biggest metaphors and most important metaphors in London is mind-forged manacles. Uh, manacles are handcuffs, as we know, which is a restraint. Now, not only are they physically restrained and geographically restrained through the way charted, but actually um, mind forged manacles is mentally they are trapped they are trapped by authority when I go on to the next slide we're going to say that authority not is not only the government but it is also religion um, and even the royal family so if we just start with Ozymandias again we've got the adjective vast which we know means massive and powerful and Ozymandias himself is presented as powerful here but we also get the adjective antique um, and the land Ozymandias reigned over is clearly aged and valued. But there's a heavy irony there because remember, we wouldn't have known it was Ozymandias or who he was had the traveller not explained. Shattered visage, the face is destroyed. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I've put the word face twice there. My, uh, my mistake. Uh, the passing of time has destroyed him. It has destroyed his legacy and the statue. So we really see the power of time there because it's killed him, it's ruined the statue and his legacy is no more, his empire is no more. And therein lies that powerful uh, adjective of shattered. And this links us straight into frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Um, we have the implication that his authority is aggressive and arrogant in the way that he sneers at people. Uh, when he gives out commands, he's not very happy. And the single word command does show us his power. To go back to London then, uh, the repetition of every is absolute. It's not just a single man, William Blake, who is upset by the way that he is controlled, but actually it is every single person that lives in the capital city. 
this uh, worsens when we get to the church because the metaphor of every blackening church appalls. It's literal because the chimney sweeps ended up black off their job, but it's also metaphorical because they lost their innocence and their lives because of this job. And don't forget the the colour black has connotations of death. And we are appalled, the reader is appalled, and William Blake is appalled that the church does nothing about it. Um, that religion, something sacred, does not intervene. So the controlling of the government has now leaked to the church and the church is um, also controlling people in terms of not, not helping and um, manipulating the chimney sweeps. This again links straight into the next metaphor, which is about the palace and the royal family. We get the metaphor, soldiers sigh runs in blood down palace walls. It is a symbol of the government, but it's also the idea that royalty has blood on their hands as well, because royalty and the royal family are letting it happen. And the soldier is hapless because he can't do anything about it. He is powerless in the sense that he has to follow orders. So not only is the government controlling and repressing and um, confining, the church is also a part of that as well. And now we also get the royal family. Um, and this all comes to a massive climax at the end of the poem when we get the prostitute. Now, the single word harlot suggests that the prostitute, um, there's a suggestion here that the prostitute is young and that she has a foul mouth because she blasts the child. And we would assume that the blast is verbal, um, but if in your interpretation, if you think it's physical, then that's fine. Now, the problem we've got here is that the prostitute is bringing a child into a corrupt world. Um, and William Blake goes so far as to say that the prostitute is responsible for the blight and the plague and the disease which is spread around London. In case you don't know what blight means, blight means to tarnish or destroy. And that is cleverly shown by William Blake in the oxymoron at the end, the marriage hearse, because the prostitute not only ruins the innocence of the children, but also the institution of marriage via disease. My example response is here. This is what I would say about Ozymandias, and I'll do William Blake on the next slide, and I hope it's been useful. So for Ozymandias, you might write, Shelley uses numerous adjectives to present an image of a powerful, arrogant leader, vast, colossal. They work to outline the sheer size of the statue, which suggests as a leader he was commanding. But colossal wreck also implies that the statue, and perhaps his land, have been destroyed by the potent presence of time and nature. The utilisation of the adjective antique communicates that the land reigned over by Ozymandias is aged but valued. Once again, there is an impression of a strong man. To elaborate, Shelley presents the influence of Ozymandias in his wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Clearly, the verb sneer has connotations of authority and arrogance and the alliteration in cold command reiterates the power of his orders. The speech, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, implies a powerful world of luxury where he invites people to look at his work and where he is possessive, my works. The pronoun my adds a boastful tone. However, the power of Ozymandias is fleeting in comparison to time and nature, shattered visage. Ozymandias has been destroyed and so has his statue and his land. The adjective shattered presents an image of nature ruining his legacy. Ultimately, nature has ruined the statue, showing that nature and time have more power than anything else. Fittingly, the poem concludes with boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. The alliteration of the plosive B sound emphasises that the place was once mighty and is now ruined as time has passed and killed everything, leaving only level sands. On the other hand, Blake explores the oppressive nature of government and the effect, effect it has on people. The repetition of chartered in I wandered through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, refers to confined or mapped out or even legally defined. The speaker is suggesting that the streets of London and even the Thames itself are increasingly the subject of government control. This is heightened by the metaphor and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. He is able to mark or observe in every face he meets weakness or woe. Clearly, society has worn down people so that their weaviness is physically visible. Furthermore, these 
Two lines also include the alliteration of the W. When combined with iambic tetrameter, there is a pessimistic tone created, as people feel worried about the lives they lead. Additionally, the marks are perhaps subtly linked to blights and the harlot. Blake presents a young, foul-mouthed prostitute who blasts a child, and the implications say are that the children are brought into a corrupt world. Therefore, the prostitute is also responsible for the blight, plague, and disease which is spread. To solidify this, Blake uses the oxymoron marriage hearse, suggesting that the prostitute not only ruins children and their innocence, but also the institute of marriage. Okay, so those are the things I might write about Ozymandias and London. Uh, again, please see my individual videos for that. And if you don't know poetic terminology, check my video on poetic terminology as well. Um, apologies about the app I've used here. Um, it's a little bit shaky. I hope this has been useful. Uh, I have a tendency to talk quick, so go back and pause the video where you need. Um, if you need any more of my videos, just type Stacey Ray into YouTube. S-T-E-C-A-Y and Ray is R-E-A-Y and good luck in your English literature poetry exam.